Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to our webinar today on straight lines, circles, and spheres. Um, I wanted to do this class today because this session at Brookline Tai Chi, we're transitioning from working on the marriage of heaven and earth qigong, and we're going to go back to gods playing in the clouds. And it's been about a year, I think, since we've done the gods set. And so with my students there, I've been talking a lot about what it's like to transition from different Qigong sets. And one of the things we'll talk about today is what you can learn from each of the different sets and how you kind of rotate through them, what that teaches you. But I actually want to use the fact that we're changing the courses as an excuse to talk about a, another practice issue. Um, and, and that's really this idea of different layers in your practice moving along this evolution from straight lines to circles to spheres. And so I really think of it as an evolution of, of the smoothness in your practice, both in terms of your body and your movement and your energy and really how that all kind of gels in your nervous system. So I'm hoping we can kind of get at that, at that as well. And I'm thinking that by the end of the class, you'll also understand uh, <laughs> or you'll also see how we can get away with doing two things at once. And I, I don't know that that's a, that's a general rule, um, but <laughs> I think in this case, uh, you have a chance to see these kind of parallel tracks work together. So a third thing that, that, that hopefully we'll talk about towards the end, too, is that Bruce often talks about gods playing in the clouds as a bridge to Taoist meditation um, compared to some of the other Qigong sets that are about the health of the physical body or dealing with other layers of energy in the body. Gods is, is positioned in our school and in our system as a bridge to meditation. So if you stick with me to the end, I think we can get to that conversation as well a little bit. Um, right now, actually, um, on danclyman.com and the, and the private coaching section in our forum, there, we're having a discussion about this very subject. And so there have been some students there sharing their meditation experience talking about where their Qigong practice fits with their meditation experience. And we're heading towards this conversation, this, this con, um, understanding of, of why God's really specifically dovetails so nicely with the meditation practice. So my, again, my hope is by the end, uh, we'll kind of map out this transition from straight lines through circles and into spherical movement both in your mind and your energy. And we'll talk about it really specifically in the context of heaven and earth and gods. And then if we have time, and I, I think we will, we'll go into what gods does specifically in this system as a bridge to meditation practice. So if that all makes sense, um, I hope it does. Feel free at any point as we're going here to just drop me a quick note, ask a question. Um, Throw in the question box there on the side. I'll see when it pops up. You can raise your hand <laughs> even here um, in your little control panel there. So anyway, check in as we go. Let me know everything's making sense. And as always, I'll try to leave some time at the end to, uh, to do any questions that you have too. So the first thing I want you to think about is what it's like. Think about how you move. Right? I threw up some pictures of, of, of a bunch of different kinds of activities. And think about some of the different activities that you go through in daily life, both in terms of physical movement, but also in terms of attention and awareness. Um, and we're going to talk about something that I actually was just, I just did an, an, another episode of Qigong Radio. I don't know if everybody's... Um, heard those yet or seen those up on the blog, but I did. I just recorded one this week with Bill Ryan, and that's going to be posted soon. And I asked Bill, we, were, we had a conversation about developing energetic sensitivity. And one of the things, which is, he, you know, he's just masterful at, and so he had some great insight into that. But one of the things that he talked about, he talked about one of the key principles in Chinese medicine and Qigong that underlies Tai Chi as well, and you, you've, you hear this often, the phrase is, 
the mind moves the chi, and the chi moves the blood. And Bill said, when I hear blood, since, you know, obviously we're mostly made up of water or fluids, right, think fluids, but then think body. So Bill's formulation is when the mind, mo or the mind moves the chi and the chi moves the body. But what was interesting to hear him say was this actually, this works the other way as well. So he, from his point of view, you could also fairly equally say the body moves the chi and the chi moves the mind. And why this is important, and we're going to sort of exploit the fact that it works both ways here, why it's important is that when you start to look at specific movement patterns, the relative degree of linear movement or circular movement or spherical movement inherent in a particular form or set has a lot to do with what, how it opens up the potential for your mind and your energy to move. I'll say that again, and, and, and we're going to go through several examples, right? If the, how the body moves influences how your mind moves, and our goal is to move along this continuum from a rigid, hard, stop-start kind of mind to some, a mind that's more flowing and fluid and circular and spherical, and we'll talk about what spherical movement means, if that's the, that's the goal is to move through this process, these stages, then how the movements are designed is either going to help us do it better or, or not. So how you move is going to matter when you try to work on this process. So the first place that we want to kind of look at it is in the physical movements. And, and just to recap some of the things that we've been talking about, let's talk about kinds of physical movements that we go through. Right? The first thing that most of us relate to here is kind of an on-off physical movement. And what that means is that there's stop and start somewhere in your nervous system. So it, it could be the actual movements have corners and edges, um, or your nervous system, there are gaps in your nervous system, or there are places where you hold and you freeze up. There are freeze points in your movements. So the first stage that you go through with this um, is to learn how to take some of the stop-start, the on-off qualities out of your movements. And Bruce, I think, illustrates this really nicely when he, he always, in, in cases like this, talks about what it's like to learn to write. He talks about penmanship. And he says, if you watch a little kid, their first letters that they write, right, there's, they're huge. It's a bunch of sticks and <laughs> straight lines, and all the corners don't match up. So you have a big gap in the letter A right at the top when you try to draw, draw the, connect these two slanted lines. And then there's a third one coming right across the middle that doesn't start or stop in line sort of smoothly with the other ones. And I see this all the time whenever, you know, Day one, we're going to start new classes next week. People will come in and start to learn Tai Chi. And because of the precision in the choreography and the coordination it takes, they have more on-off kind of movement. I show them the first move, and it's a bunch of sticks and lines that don't quite match up. So I want you to understand that this is natural. Anytime you sort of do your first pass at patterning something into the body, you're going to have that stop-startness. But you have to pay attention, if you want to get past that stage, you have to pay attention to something really specifically. And I call it turning the wheel. And I, I found this picture of a, a nice big tire, a nice big wheel here to get you this feeling. The reason I did was um, when I first learned, well, no, when, when I went to my first instructor training with Bruce, that was 2004 out in a retreat center in Northern California. And at least my recollection, I don't know if this is true or not, but my memory is that we went out there and uh, we, would pra we would have class in the woods and then scatter around to practice. And whether it was this particular lesson we were learning or whether there was actually an old tire kind of tossed away in the woods, I can't, I can't quite clearly remember at this point. But I remember this distinct sensation of the first time we were doing circling hands where you just move your arms and your hands in a, in a circle. Sounds really simple, right? But I remember the first time I had this sensation of not having stop-start movement. And actually it was a little unnerving. It was a little, uh, 
it was it was strange because as you turn the wheel, you go around the wheel, and by definition, there's no stop start place. So you know that sensation when you come you crest over the top of the Ferris wheel and it feels like you're going forward, but all of a sudden you're going down and you're going forward at the same time. Well, imagine that continuously going around the circle as if you were kind of endlessly falling into the next arc of the circle. To me, it felt like falling initially, but now it feels like that's a, that's a sign. That's a, a feeling that you want to start to look for in the body. And as you go around the circle, the hand keeps falling and falling and falling, and the body keeps releasing. So you want to start to see turning the wheel, doing circular movement as continuous release. So stage one, you have stop-start movement. The nervous system grabs and holds. The nervous system let go, lets go. Stage two, you get continuous release. So the nervous system lets go, and then lets go in a slightly different way, and lets go. And it has this continuous feeling of releasing as you move. And you never find stuck spots, or you never get hung up on them. So that's the big jump from going from on-off movement, linear straight line movement, to circular movement. And when we do an exercise in a little bit, I'll show you exactly where to look for this feeling of having no stuck spots. The next, some of you might recognize this movement. It's um, Fair Lady at the Shuttles. It's a, a movement from our, our Tai Chi long form. Um, and I picked it, obviously, I don't know if it's, it's probably not that obvious if you don't know the move now, but I picked it because there are a few places in the Tai Chi form, and, and more so actually, this is interesting, in the long form than the short form, which makes sense if you're thinking about our progression here. But there are a few places in our long form, and eventually more and more places, where the spheres of the movement are really obvious. And I, I call this kind of rolling the ball stage, what you want to get to after you've practiced turning the wheel. So if you imagine what it feels like for your hands to go around in a circle as if they were literally um, tracing the contour, the rim of a wheel, as you're turning that wheel, imagine what your hands feel like going over the wheel. The next level, when you start to key into circular movement, it's the difference between going around a wheel and going over a ball. So if you've got the wheel, it's like you just go around one, you go around the equator of the ball, right? And that's like turning the wheel. But now if you run your hand continuously over the top, the bottom, the sides of the ball, and you do it with both hands, all of a sudden the dimensions that have to shift and change are much greater. And so if you, the place that you want, the thing that you want to see here is that just what it takes in your awareness to track the rolling feeling continuously is going to be a, a, a jump in the number of dimensions that you'll have to track at once compared to the very uh, different feeling already of going around a wheel. So I'm going to try to explain how to, how to get there and, and how to work on this a little bit um, as we go. There's some exercises you can do. But the, the, the basic idea that we want to lay out so far is the difference, if you take it really simply, between taking your hands first stage, making a square, forward, down, back, up. As you go through your practice, you try to turn that into a circle. So you go forward, falling forward, <laughs> falling down, falling down and back, falling up and in and up and out, so you have this constant kind of two-dimensional change. And when you get into sphericality, it's another dimension. I don't even know if it's three dimensions now or four or more or what, but you're going to have even more stuff to track. And if you go back to Bill's basic rule that the body moves the chi and the chi moves the mind, then what you've done, if you figure out in your nervous system how to make these more spherical movements, how to roll the ball and stay with it physically, release your nervous system in a way that allows the physical thing to happen, then all of a sudden what you've done is you hitched your mind to the movements in a way that's going to start to open the mind and open your awareness in this new way. 
So the first major point here is that if you go through this progression of straight lines to circles to spheres with your physical movements, you're starting to key into the movement of the mind. So that's our first, that's the first biggie that we want to get to. Is that making sense to everybody? Do you have any, any questions so far? Or just want to make sure everybody's on board. So now we've got to start talking about the movement of the mind. And when you go into this territory, I think the most useful thing is to start to look at the specific Qigong sets. A few a couple months ago, we did one of these for the marriage of heaven and earth when we were making the transition from energy gates to heaven and earth. And I had Eric Peters on, and our, one of our senior instructors. And Eric talked a little bit about what he saw as the difference between, for example, the standing practice in opening the energy gates and the moving practice of the marriage of heaven and earth. And for him, one of the most important things in the marriage of heaven and earth, I'm sorry, in energy gates, let's, before we get to heaven and earth, the most important thing for him in energy gates was something that he calls penetrating the shell, working towards this, preparing for this moment. Um, and this is a, this is sort of a classic, classical phrase that describes the quality and the level of your awareness when you can put your mind inside your body. You can feel and generate internal movement with your mind. That's where we want to get to in heaven and earth. But he says energy gates gives you amazing preparation for that. And let's just outline why that is. Let's think about why that is for a second. The primary practice in energy gates is the standing body scan. And so the experience of going through the standing practice is a little bit like walking into a dark room and trying to shine your flashlight on all the different parts of the room. And at first, you have a pretty small beam and a pretty weak signal. So you have to go right up to the wall, <laughs> go up to something really obvious in that room and shine the light right on it. And you still only see a little point. Over time, your light gets bigger and bigger. Your internal awareness gets broader and broader until eventually when you do your standing practice, you can turn the lights on in the house and the room lights up itself and you're not there with the little flashlight anymore you've got you've got wiring <laughs> you've got you can turn it on but here's something we didn't talk about in in that in that class when we were talking about what is it like to get started with energy gates and it's an important point for today's topic of moving from straight lines to spheres what you cultivate when you start off doing the dissolving process, right? So your initial body scans are about feeling into the body and feeling anything that you possibly can. And so you've, the most obvious sensations to start to feel for are tension, pain, discomfort, uh, contraction, right? These are all, as Bill says in, in that in the other, the Qigong radio episode, he says, you're feeling the effects of the chi in the body. So a chi that's not moving smoothly through the body leaves these lingering physical effects. So when you start out trying to feel through that dark room of your internal landscape, you feel all the effects of energy that isn't moving cleanly through your system. And the kind of awareness that you employ, and here's what's really relevant to today, the kind of awareness that you end up using to feel those effects of chi is in one sense very linear kind of awareness. It's a single point of awareness. And what I mean by linear awareness is that you can only feel one thing at a time. So this is the, this is the game initially with energy gates. I'm feeling down through my body and I feel something off in my shoulder. And so I feel into my shoulder and I learn to feel deeper and deeper and deeper into the gate of the shoulder into the center of the shoulder and that's awesome and that you're developing the strength of your feeling awareness but do you know what happens when somebody's first learning energy gates and they focus on their shoulder you can literally watch the entire rest of their body contort and contract around their attention at that single point so their their spine starts to drop 
their knee alignments go out, the other shoulder slumps and collapses. So that, from a, mo a point of view of the movement of your mind, is linear awareness. That's a single point of awareness in the sense that you are unable to pay attention to anything else, and the rest of the show kind of collapses. So there's a learning stage there, right? There's the initial thing of, I can only feel one thing at a time, and it's at the expense of everything else. And from, from a movement of the mind point of view, that's a straight line. That's the equivalent of the little kid trying to write the letter A and not connecting the lines together. They get one line really, really well, and then they go on to the next line, and then they go on to the next line. But there's no continuity between the lines, and there's no connection between them. So when you start out doing energy gates, that's where you're at. You're at that straight line phase. When you get to the marriage of heaven and earth, presumably you've worked with getting your mind inside your body for a while. And I should say, I'm going to present these Qigong sets as a linear progression, but we can talk later about the value. Obviously, what we're doing at Brookline Tai Chi right now is we're cycling through them. And everybody I know who gets good at this stuff cycles through them. So even though you come out at the other end 10 years later and you say, you know, the best thing would actually just to be if, I, if somebody just stands for seven years and then they'll get heaven and earth in one year and, and God's in the next year and they'll be all set in nine years instead of the 10 years it took me fumbling around cycling through. I don't know why people do this, but but there's some kind of bias that gets created when when you've gone through a process that you think you can reverse engineer it and, and teach other people in a more efficient, uh, better way. And, and some of that's true, but um, there's a little bit of a fallacy there that fumbling around and cycling through these things is not the best way to go. And actually, when, uh, when Bruce was here in town doing the push hands training a few weeks ago, I, he asked me how the class was going, and I said, this is, the push hand stuff is great. It's so clear. It's step one, step two, step three as you go through. And, and I said to him, I tried to teach the Qigong classes at Brookline Tai Chi like that, but it, it never works. And I, I kind of realized it as soon as I said it, but he gives me this look like, well, duh, obviously. And he went on to explain to me that the way people take in Qigong principles is circular. It's not linear. And so you get variation in terms of people's energetic makeup, and you've got variation in terms of just the, the rate of absorption for the material. So when we're talking about, for, for ease of conversation here, we're going to talk about the Qigong sets in a pretty linear way. But I hope you'll start to see that the way they actually work is a little more circular, or maybe even spherical, when we get down to it. So again, our transition from energy gates into heaven and earth. In energy gates, we tried to penetrate the shell. We tried to get direct feeling awareness into the body. And for the longest time, for somebody doing energy gates, that's going to mean that you focus on one thing inside the body at the expense of everything else. But now, when we get into heaven and earth, because of the nature of the things inside the body that we're trying to move, you can't hold on to the single point anymore. And when I talked to Paul Cavell recently about working with the soft tissue in the body, this point got very clear to me. If you go back to our three styles of movement that we talked, physical movement that we talked about initially, on off, circular, and spherical, heaven and earth for most people is a big aha moment when it comes to working with the muscles along that continuum. See, most of us, when we feel our muscles and we're trained to move our muscles, we work on contracting and releasing them, which is essentially the phase one, the on-off style of movement, the straight line style of movement. In heaven and earth, because of the way that you train your body to lengthen, you lengthen the fascia and the soft tissue, you can't contract release. You can't do on-off movement and actually lengthen the way it's designed to be done. You can stretch and you can pull on fibers, but the secret to how you actually do lengthening in the marriage of heaven and earth is by continuously releasing 
the nerves in order to free up the tissue. I'll say that again. In heaven and earth, you lengthen everything by continuously releasing the nerves. Now, that sounds exactly like turning the wheel, where as you go through heaven and earth, there's no fixed point. There's no stop point. You have to turn the wheel, turn over, and continuously release. That's what we're trying to do in the marriage of heaven and earth. And what, what's cool about it is that you go from feeling it in the limbs first to feeling it in the torso to eventually, and this is where the name comes from, feeling the sense of release and lengthen in a sort of a wave. You go to wave-like quality in the movement. You feel that go from below the feet to above the head and from above the head to below the feet. This is the name of the move, the marriage of heaven and earth, unifying the energy that's rising all the time from the earth and up through our bodies with the energy that's dropping all the time or descending all the time from above and down through the bodies. So our bodies. So you're, you're playing with these two giant waves of up and down flows in the body. And the only way to adequately get that kind of movement to flow in an unimpeded way is to go to a naturally more circular kind of awareness. So I hope that's starting to make sense, that if you want waves to move through the body and energy to move through the body in the most flowing way, you have to go from stop-start to more circular and more flowing. Now where this gets interesting is the kind of awareness that we use in God's playing in the clouds. Because we're going to do something here, and these are two of the God's movements, we're going to do something here that's a little bit more sophisticated than just waves in one direction at a time or stop, start, straight line movement. In this system, God's is, is kind of revered as the hallmark of the, set, of the whole system. It's the place where you take all the little things that are highlighted by the other, other parts of the system and you get them to fuse and integrate. And I want to talk a little bit about how that integration happens. What needs to happen in order for things to be integrated? So there's, let me, let me tell you about this marsh by my house now. Um, they recently moved near the ocean and there's a freshwater cove connected to the ocean behind my house. And every morning when I take the dog out, <laughs> we go behind the house and depending on the time of day or the morning of the week with the tides, the marsh is in sort of either full and brimming or dry and empty. And it's one of my favorite, my favorite parts of the day when I go in the morning and see kind of what state the marsh is in, where are the tides at. And as I've been thinking about how to present this material and, and what it feels like to even do gods in the first place, one of the things that occurs to me is that the feeling of the movements, if you look at the movement on the left and the movement on the right, that's essentially that tidal movement. And think about it from the center of the body. Right, What you're focusing on when you go into that crouch, you gather the arms in, with your mind what you're doing is you're trying to make the inside of the body feel like the marsh at high tide. You're trying to get a sense for, through the rhythm of the movements, the energy rushing in, being absorbed into the center of the body. And then when you release, when you come up, when the arms go out, everything rushes out. The, the beds of the tissue of the body, the fluids moving through the body, feel like the water leaving the marsh as, at low tide. And what you're doing is you're making the linkages inside the body and the movement of the mind stronger and stronger the more tidal each repetition of the movement feels. So essentially, you know, it's not just waves through, it's this washing in and out. It's the absorbing in and out using your mind to feel the tissue and to make the energy move in these circulation patterns. So 
when you do gods, you're thinking about in and out. You're thinking about on and off, right? So it goes one direction, it turns around, and goes the other direction. That's our basic circular movement, our basic straight line movement. Is it going away or is it going towards, one way or the other? But you also have circular movement, right? If you look at the shapes of the God's movements, there's not one of them that isn't circular. They all are big circles. So you can key into it at a circular circularity level. But the third feature, and this is much harder to uncover in energy gates or heaven and earth, and we'll talk about Tai Chi as a separate case in a few minutes, the third ingredient here that makes God's work is not only are you making circles, but you have the sense of absorbing and you have the sense of releasing. And the big difference here when you're feeling into the body is not that you're feeling a single thing, like a single point, like that energy gate that we started out with that you learned to feel, but you feel the movement going through everything. And to me, that's, that's the big jump. If you can start to feel the container of the movement, the shape of the movement, and the movement through the body, so you feel a sense of something moving through your mind, through your awareness, and through your body all at the same time, but it's not your mind, it's not your body, and it's not your awareness, now you're into the game of the, spher the spherical nature of God's. So I don't know if, if this makes sense. This is a pretty different concept because you have to sort of maintain all the other levels of things that we worked on before, but you also are then adding this other dimension of something that you're tracking that's not any of them. It's a container for them. That's what we want to get after with God's playing in the clouds. And... As weird conceptually as this sounds, or as daunting conceptually as this sounds, remember Bill's key principle here, that not only does the mind move the chi and the chi move the body, but you can work it in reverse. The body moves the chi and the chi moves the mind. This is, a, this is a, an idea that I've been talking to every senior instructor about. The problem with having this stuff laid out for you <laughs> is that you automatically jump to the most sophisticated conceptual level of information. But the reality is your, it's, it's the, the way that your body and your energy assimilate the information and that pace, not your thinking brain, that's going to be the real beneficial thing. So all of us here, when we hear this stuff, we can handle the concept of circles and straight lines and spheres, and we know in a sort of mental way that the spheres are the most sophisticated. And so we think of the status thing of like, well, I know spheres are better than circles, so I'm going to do spheres. The reality is what your body and what your energy are ready for may be totally different. You may be that, you know, second grader trying to write letters or something and, and have that choppy choppy script. So the thing though that I want I want you to realize about gods and the thing that Bill's Bill's practice principle of letting the body move the energy and move the mind, that lets you off the hook. Because now you don't have to figure this all out conceptually and hold it in your awareness first in order to make your energy move, in order to make your body move. Just do the movements. <laughs> Make spherical movements. Make circles first. Circles will become spheres. And what I'm trying to do by bringing these concepts out is to sort of point you in a direction. That if you practice this, if you do your repetitions and do your weekly practice over months and maybe over years, these concepts will resonate on deeper and deeper levels. But you don't have to get you don't want to try to get ahead of yourself conceptually too much. So let's try something. Let's try a breathing exercise here that will take us through some of the sensations that go from circles or lines to circles to spheres. Because I, I think feeling through some of these different sensations will be useful when it comes to doing this and a little bit different than uh just hearing me talk about them. 
I think a bre breathing is a, a nice place to start just because in this format it's a little bit hard to do some group choreography. So let's start with a little bit of breathing. And all I want you to do at first is to just settle into it and find the rhythm of your breath. You know, if you know all the Taoist breathing principles, great. Don't worry about that right now. I just want you to feel the air in and out of the nose. So let's take a second and find that. And the first thing to start to move us a little bit from the straight line to the circular, the first thing to do is to notice your transitions from inhale to exhale. So this is where most of us will gap out. You get a nice long inhale going, and you'll be thinking about the middle of that inhale. But then you'll turn over and you'll start exhaling, and the turnover is actually what you want to pay attention to, not to have a gap in your awareness or a gap in your breathing to jump from one to the other. So for a minute here, Feel what it feels like to go from inhale to exhale. And the circularity that we want to start to cultivate is going to allow us to sort of work deeper and deeper into the body. So if you put your hands on your belly for a second, Here's another way that we want to feel the same transition. So most of us, when we learn belly breathing, which is the foundation of all the Taoist breathing techniques, what we do is we push the belly out, and then we pull it in. So essentially, you're going from, you're, you're creating muscular contraction and release in that light switch kind of on-off kind of way to try to drive the breathing mechanism. So just for a minute, with your hands on your belly or, or directly with your feeling awareness, try to feel the movements in the abdomen that are less straight line, less contract and release, and a little more circular. So that means you have to have some awareness of when one phase is coming to the end, and then the next phase kind of beginning. And you'll, you'll get a better and better handoff between them. And over the next minute or two, I want you to try to make this part of the breathing exercise less about air exchange and more about internal movement. So I don't care about that, what it feels like, the stuff going in and out of your nose. What I want you to feel for is what it feels like for the space inside the body to be moving. This was the jump from energy gates to heaven and earth. And now we're going to try to make the next jump to something that's a little bit more like God's playing in the clouds. So what you need to do for this is, again, it's useful to have the hands on the belly, but what I want you to do is I want you to try to get the shape of everything from the front of the body, the sides of the body, and the back, so the entire abdominal cavity. So 
initially, again, we do this in the, in the straight line kind of way where you practice directly moving the sides, moving the kidney area, moving the front of the belly, and even section by section in the front of the belly. But right now, what you want to have instead of the individual pieces is you want to have a sense of the whole. And this is a sphere, the whole sphere of the abdominal cavity. So for the next few breaths, just start to bring the sphere into your awareness. Now on the inhale and on the exhale when you're working with the sphere, this is where you want to start to introduce the movement of the mind a little bit more. So you're going to have to play with this for a second and see which phase makes more sense. But what you want to feel for when you've got that whole sphere is that on one phase of your breath, your mind goes through the whole sphere and the sphere itself condenses into the center. And then on the other phase, the sphere expands in every direction. So see which one makes sense, inhale or exhale. And a word about the breathing here, you're still breathing, but you're using the breathing, again, not so much to move air in and out of your lungs, but you're using it as an awareness tool. We've talked about that before. So see naturally which phase of the breathing lets everything condense into the middle of the body, into the lower dantian, and then which phase of the, of the breath Let's everything expand out just to the limits of that sphere, just out to the abdominal cavity. And as best you can here, you want to dial back your focus a little bit. And you want to look for that sensation of something moving through the abdominal cavity. The mind moving through the abdominal cavity, a sense of your energy moving through all the little spaces in the abdominal cavity in that spherical pattern, condensing into the middle, expanding out from the middle. And again, it's just like the marsh behind my house. The tide rushes in and fills every little space that it rolls over. And then the tide goes out, everything dries up, and the water is released from everything. So the more balanced and whole that sphere feels, the more naturally everything will become more saturated and you'll start to feel stuff moving through the body. And then just for the last minute here, dial your focus way back. Don't try to do anything. Just feel what's there. The secret to doing Qigong well is when you, you get towards the end of a set, you hang back. And the rationale here is that you're thinking of it like having primed a big pump. If you've stimulated the flows in the body, then if you sit back and watch for a few repetitions, those flows will be going automatically. And that's the real reason. That's the real reason we do it, from my point of view, and the big payoff that you carry through into the rest of your day. So just here, dial back your focus on the breathing. See if you've created a pulse and a wave and a spherical sense of movement in and out of the lower dantian. Yeah, good, good, okay. How's, how's that going? Is, it, is that making sense? Any questions on that exercise specifically before we go to the, the next thing here? Okay, well, 
let's talk a little bit about what we just did and, and, and why it kind of leads you to the next practice. See, what we were trying to do with that exercise is to play with different ways the mind can interface with the body. Right? Even the fact that you could feel a difference between air moving in and out of your nose, right? which I would argue is a pretty straight line kind of feeling, and then you shifted your awareness to paying attention to transitions, which gets you into circular territory. And then you were tracking this flow from center to periphery in the body, feeling something move through. But you were doing the same activity the whole time. You were breathing the whole time, right? So by changing your awareness, changing literally changing the internal movement patterns, you can start to shift how each of the physical movements are done. And so, like, if you do a Tai Chi practice, right, you want to watch people do their Tai Chi and you want to try to find some way to track your own progress over time and see if you're moving along this continuum. Every new move that you learn is going to be a stick figure move. It's going to be straight lines. But what stage do you have to go to where you pay attention to the transitions or the sense of continuously turning the wheel? That's a whole other method of practice. And when you get more and more comfortable with that, and you can let that kind of awareness or let that kind of movement be in your awareness the entire time you do Tai Chi, uh -huh, then you start to pay attention to flows in a much different way. And God's actually really helps you set this up, right? Because in the marriage of heaven and earth, we emphasize opening and closing the joints. So if you think about your shoulder, your elbow, your wrist, and your hand, the joint spaces will open sequentially or simultaneously, it doesn't matter, so that your hand gets further away from your spine. And then the joint spaces close and the hand comes into the spine. So you work this thing back and forth where you open out from the spine to the fingertips and you work back in from the fingertips to the spine. That's a straight line opening and closing, even if you make it really, really smooth. Well, what happens is that you start to do those openings and closings in a circle, and it makes them much, much smoother, right? The movements of heaven and earth, you're doing two big circles, two major circles, or if you practice encircling hands. There's a major jump in the practice when you learn how to feel the opening and closing happening as you're making the circular practice, as you're making the circular shape. Well, in God's, you take the same opening and closing of the joints, and instead of making a circle with the arms and the, the legs and the body, you start making spheres. And so you take the twisting of the soft tissue, the turning of the limbs, and you add opening and closing to it, and all of a sudden, the way that the body is moving Add, there's a whole other dimension to it. You get, the cir you get the sphere going, the ball going, instead of the circle. And what that does is that will naturally set you up for the sense of movement through the body. So the same kind of saturate, the marshy kind of saturation movement that we're talking about, of the tide rushing in and the tide flowing out. When you start to move in a spherical way, the negong that you're using, the twisting, the opening and closing, the shapes of the movements, are all naturally bringing you towards that level of practice. And so you get to this higher level practice just by learning how to harmonize these three or four different things, the turning, the twisting, the opening and closing, and the spherical movement. The more smoothly those come together, the more you're already affecting your mind. You could do gods for years just thinking about how do I make a, a better sphere. And you're creating the integration in the body. It's not something separate. right? You will be naturally integrating your nervous system more in this spherical way. You're working on your mind. You're softening your mind so that it can hold these three or four things at once instead of getting stuck on one, then two, then three. The real payoff of, of spherical movement is that it changes the quality of mind that you can bring to anything. And so instead of working on one thing at a time, and then you think about the next thing, and you think about the next thing, you start to sense more than one thing at a time. And you start to feel the shape of the movement, what's going on inside the movement, and how things are passing through the movement without getting sucked into each little detail and each little piece. 
So to me, that's the big payoff. And it's not like it's something you have to choose to do. It's something that's naturally going to start happening for your mind and your awareness as you work on the body and as you work on these movements. So what you should do later today <laughs> or what you should try tomorrow when you're working on your practice is this. Start out with something that's more linear. Just like we do, this is what we did with the breathing, right? You start out with something that's linear, but now I'm talking about a physical movement. And then go ahead and think about the transitions. Work on the transitions. Focus on the transitions once you set up the physical movement. After a while, even if you're doing arm goes out, arm comes in, the shape that you'll want to adopt is naturally going to be a circle. So run with the circle. Make the circle bigger. So it looks like, if it looked like a box before, now, or something going in, something coming out, now it's going to turn into a circle and smooth out. And then finally, once you get the circle primed and moving, now you make the next major jump in your awareness. You start to feel from the center of your body, as you're doing the circle or the sphere, out to the ends of the body. And as you flow the other way, you start to feel in. And you prime that pattern as many times as it takes to get everything circulating and moving until, and this is the most important part, you just sit back and you wait and you see if you can just feel the tides going in and out and see what that feels like. And when you've hit that point in your practice, you've hit a real integration point. And that's the state that you want to get yourself into again and again and again. And to me, that's what we're trying to do, going from straight lines to circles to spheres. So I know we've gone through a lot of stuff today. <laughs> we've covered a lot of territory. Um, but I hope that gives you a few ideas about what you can do in terms of your movements, how, how to actually look at the physical movements, how to look and, and work with the specific Qigong sets that we're working on, and then just kind of more generally, it's always easy to forget sort of why we're doing this stuff in the first place. So I hope that gives you some ideas about how to then think about what's important in your practice and think that the physical work that we're doing and the energetic work that we're doing has a real serious payoff that you'll start to find parallels to in other areas of your life. Um, yeah, it becomes pretty amazing sort of awareness and mind training. And, and that's cool to see showing up everywhere else. So let me know if you have any questions. I want to thank you for sitting with me for an hour here and going through this. And um, yeah, like I said before, a lot of the subjects that we're covering in these classes obviously come out of the changing courses and curriculum at Brookline Tai Chi. But a lot of it comes from questions and feedback on the blog or in the discussion forum on the coaching section of the site. This was kind of the conversation that was going on. So it gives us a chance to have the conversation in a bigger way and to, to dive deeper into uh, these issues when we, when we hold a class like this. So thanks so much for coming. If you're listening to the recording, thank you for that. And uh, yeah, to be continued. Thank you, guys.